what I need to talk about. And so, uh, so now I have the uh, very wonderful task of being able to introduce uh, Fabrizio Zilobotti to give his presidential lecture. So as I'm sure all of you know, uh, Fabrizio is a professor at the University of Zurich. He's pre previously been at UCL in Stockholm. He was the winner of the Euro Johansson Award. He's now the editor of Econometrica and has previously been editor of the Journal of the Economic, uh, the European Economic Association and the Review of Economic Studies, amongst the many other things that he's done. So I've had the great pleasure of being a colleague of Fabrizio's at UCL, of working with him on research and writing papers together, and of sitting on a large number of committees. And uh, Fabrizio, the last not being so pleasurable as the former, but uh, Fabrizio has always been a joy to work with because of his professionalism, his energy, and his great humor. And uh, I very much appreciated all of that, as many of us have in the profession. So I'm very much looking forward to his talk. And uh, without any further ado, let's welcome Fabrizio. Rachel is a friend, so he's obviously too kind to me. But, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, China, which has been one of the main preoccupation uh, of my research in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, sometimes people ask me what uh, attracted me to do research in China, and I think this uh, is a short answer. Uh, this is a picture that shows uh, what the share of the world GDP is accounted for by uh, you know, three large uh, actors, the European Union, the United States, and China. Uh, just to give the right proportion, uh, most people know here, but uh, uh, China today has uh, 1.34 uh, billion people, and the U European Union and United States together would account for about 800 million. Uh, if we go back to 1980, the share of the world GDP accounted for by China was about 2.5%. Today, uh, China accounts uh, uh, for uh, about the same as the United States and uh, uh, European Union, so uh, 17, 18 percent, depending on the estimates. And uh, it's uh, uh, set to come the largest uh, uh, economic, economic power worldwide, if we measure it in total GDP. Now, of course, uh, this does not mean that uh, China's living standards are yet comparable to those of industrialized economies, but uh, if we again uh, make the experiment of comparing China in 1980 with China today, well, we observe that in terms of uh, uh, GDP per capita, uh, China has uh, uh, made an impressive uh, improvement there too. Uh, in uh, uh, 1980, well, estimate, estimates back then are, are controversial, but uh, let me take uh, the most optimistic uh, from the pen world table would be uh, uh, 5%, and today it's uh, getting close to, it's in the range of 20 to 25% relative to the US. So there has been this uh, uh, massive uh, process of economic convergence that has actually, you know, first started in, uh, with economic reform of the 1980s and then has uh, uh, accelerated. Uh, China also was a negligible player in, uh, in the international trade scene. Uh, China is today the largest exporter worldwide. Sometimes people ask, uh, you know, growth economists uh, uh, only care about uh, GDP growth, but what about uh, economic development? Well, uh, uh, of course, on this uh, score, uh, the, the, I should make a, a much uh, longer and detailed argument, and also uh, a number of uh, uh, problematic issues uh, are associated with the economic growth of China. But uh, this uh, does not take away a very important observation that in 1980, 88% uh, of uh, the Chinese population lived in condition that the World Bank classifies in, in somehow arbitrary way, if you want, that there's a threshold uh, uh, count, uh, head count, uh, as living in extreme poverty. So it was uh, uh, the, you know, the, the bulk of the problem of extreme poverty was concentrated in China, and today that number is uh, below 10%. I understand that. Uh, whether it's uh, what exact point estimate uh, is also subject to some question that concern uh, uh, price deflators. So this may be overly optimistic picture that does not take away that uh, there has been a massive change. Now, uh, <coughs> convergence 
was especially fast in the 21st century. So actually, you know, most of our models predict that convergence should start fast and then decline. In, in China, it has happened a bit like the, a bit of the opposite, uh, probably because there's been so many uh, reform, uh, you know, entering the WTO, etc. So the first decade of the 21st century was the, the, the magic decade, if you want, for China. Uh, then after 2011, uh, we started hearing about the problems with uh, economic growth uh, of China. Actually, if you look at uh, the annual growth rate, it would not look as if uh, 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 China is, uh, uh, certainly it has slowed down because it, you know, from 10% to 6 to 7%, there's a difference, but still it's one of the fastest growing economy worldwide still. But uh, there are uh, other signs that uh, uh, the uh, economy of China uh, is experiencing problems. So we, has, we have observed a sharp fall in the TFP growth. The return to investment, this was one of these uh, magic observations that they, they were not falling against uh, the prediction of many models. Well, now they have fallen and, and very, very sharply. Uh, there are sectors of the economy that are kept alive somehow artificially, but uh, China has a big problem of excess, excess capacity in uh, areas like cement and steel, where the demand worldwide has fallen, but uh, uh, you know, part of that fall is is, is, is related to the crisis of some sector like construction sector in China. Uh, there has been also increasing uh, concern for financial stability, uh, phenomena such as the stock market turbulence or uh, uh, the boom of uh, uh, private and uh, public debt and the increase of shadow banking have been mentioned as uh, 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 you know, source of uh, uh, concern uh, about uh, the sustainability of the current path of economic growth for China. Now, from the point of view of uh, uh, you know, someone interested in long-run growth, uh, rather than you know, each of these uh, uh, specific aspects, there is a kind of broad picture issue that uh, is uh, the question, is China somehow uh, approaching uh, the end of this, its economic miracle. Some people say, uh, is China hitting the wall? Uh, so there is some evidence that I would not uh, uh, classify as 100% uh, you know, conclusive, but uh, at least some studies, and here is one of the uh, one account from a, 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 a group of uh, researchers at uh, the IMF, this is from an IMF working paper, that uh, emphasized how economies, when they reach uh, uh, something like uh, uh, 25, 30 percent uh, distance uh, of um, uh, GDP relative to the frontier GDP, uh, they experience some slowdown. So this is a bit of uh, an unusual graph where that is constructed like this. Uh, time t equal to zero is defined as the year when the log GDP per capita for a particular country reaches uh, 3,000 US dollar in PPP terms, and then it follows the trajectory of these countries. So these are all economy, all emerging economies that at some point in their history have done very well. So it's not uh, the case of you know, uh, failed states that have been in long-term stagnation, but a number of them, and particularly the Latin American countries, uh, many, of the, many Latin American countries have been in this uh, situation, have actually start fast and then slow down. And then they have settled, they continue to grow, but their convergence path, uh, trajectory is, uh, is uh, uh, much less impressive. Uh, there are a couple of important uh, exceptions, like Korea and Taiwan. So Korea and Taiwan have continued their trajectory and uh, have uh, essentially reached uh, the, the club of countries that are classified as high-income economies. So uh, is China set to take uh, the... the uh, 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 virtuous trajectory of these few economies, or it's going to uh, into troubles like other economies. So, in this uh, uh, presentation, I want to go through three steps. The first is uh, uh, to present uh, an analytical framework uh, uh, conceptually without uh, any equation. Uh, it's actually uh, a large part of this, not new, is uh, related to the work that uh, uh, Philippe Aguillon, uh, Daron Semoglu, and uh, I uh, uh, worked at uh, some 10 years ago and published in the, in the Journal of European Economic Association, where we make the distinction between investment-led growth and innovation-led growth. I will explain it uh, in, uh, in detail. Uh, then I'm going to try to apply this to China. So I'm going to argue that China has grown until now, uh, uh, hinging, the growth has 
uh, hinges very strongly on uh, uh, capital accumulation and investment and the adoption of uh, uh, technologies uh, that uh, have been uh, uh, transfer to China, mostly thanks to the process of foreign direct investment. Uh, I'm also going to argue that reallocation has been a very important process, and that has generated a lot of productivity uh, growth. Uh, in the final part of the talk, I want to, so I, I want to document how different studies uh, uh, have uh, uh, you know, analyzed that this process of investment-led growth. And uh, let me say it uh, uh, beforehand. I will, I will be very selective. We'll talk about a number of studies. And by no means, uh, I will try to make uh, uh, a, you know, a complete survey of the literature. So many people uh, who are here uh, will not see themselves, but still have, uh, may have uh, probably contributed importantly to that, that debate. So uh, and, and in, the, in the last part, I want to talk about the transition into innovation-led growth. Is China making that transition? And some ongoing research. Uh, that uh, I'm doing on that. So uh, let me talk now about the analytical framework. The, the, the main idea is that uh, the process of growth has uh, different engines. In particular, we, we distinguish uh, between two engines. The, the first is uh, uh, far from the technology frontier. Uh, countries grow by uh, physical uh, capital accumulation. Uh, reallocation, as I was mentioning, and the imitation and adoption of technologies that are uh, used by firms uh, in, in other countries. When, as uh, closer to technology frontier, there is another engine that becomes more important, largely because, you know, the, the possibility of adopting and imitating technologies uh, uh, shrinks, uh, uh, the adoption becomes uh, more sophisticated, so it becomes more important for a country to develop a, an innovative, uh, an own innovative capacity, and so growth becomes uh, more reliant on innovation and human capital accumulation. Uh, now, there is a natural tendency of the economy to move from one stage to the other, but what uh, our work also emphasizes is that different policies are um, effective at different stages of the process of development. In particular, to support and to uh, strengthen investment-led growth, uh, some policies that are typically not uh, recommended as part of the so-called Washington Consensus uh, uh, may actually be effective. So policies that uh, create discrimination in favor of uh, some firms, uh, in favor of some groups, in favor of some areas, may actually be successful in driving the process of growth. Uh, it's the case of China, as we'll argue, but uh, uh, this was a, a, an important trait of, in the case of Korea, for instance. So, uh, w and uh, even uh, uh, some type of uh, creation of a strong position of uh, uh, incumbency advantage may be good for growth. Why is that? Well, because at an early stage of development, the, the most important problem is to mobilize resources. So alleviating coordination problem, overcoming credit and contractual frictions is especially important. For innovation, let growth, something, a different type of policies are necessary. In particular, uh, competition becomes very important. So creating the condition for level playing field competition, uh, and since much of the innovation and the new idea is carried out by uh, new startups, uh, this policy that creates uh, competition and low barriers to entry uh, uh, creates entry churning, uh, promotes cr uh, creative destruction. Financial development is especially important because uh, uh, there is a lot of risk involved in a new startup project that can have a high potential, and it's important that uh, this risk does not have to be borne by the entrepreneurs, but by specialized financial institutions like venture capital or uh, private equity. Uh, investors protection is also important to, uh, to support growth at this stage. Uh, low corruption, good institution. Now, uh, the point uh, that we make in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the theory, uh, from the formal theory, is that uh, there can be a risk of uh, 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 non-convergence trap when the policy does not change. So let me uh, exemplify this with the parable of China. So China in the 1990, so on, on this graph, on the horizontal, you see the, uh, an index of proximity to the frontiers. So the total factor of productivity at some time, t minus one, 
relative to the frontier and uh, at time t on the vertical axis. So what this graph shows is that investment-led growth for a country like China in 1990 uh, was actually more powerful engine than uh, if they had institution more, uh, uh, you know, prone to more, more uh, uh, supportive of innovation. But insistence on those institutions can actually let, can actually lead China to stick to the red line and at some point to stop uh, converging. Now, from the empirical point of view, there is a, there is a, a, a prediction of this theory that uh, the growth rate uh, of the GDP per capita is related to the uh, uh, to an index of distance to frontier. Actually, let me revert it. Let me put on the horizontal the proximity to the frontier, uh, and. The idea is that uh, when an economy is very far from the frontier, uh, so in, like in the, in the uh, close to the vertical axis, then uh, uh, countries with institutions that promote investment-led growth actually grow faster. But if those countries insist on those uh, institutions, they actually suffer a faster slowdown than uh, countries where there is uh, uh, more reliance on innovation-led growth. So this is the empirical uh, uh, implication that uh, uh, already in 2006 uh, we tested. Uh, let me give you some new highlights on that. Uh, in part, it's uh, uh, you know, updating uh, that knowledge with new data. In part, it's also looking at uh, uh, different dimensions that will be uh, particularly important for my discussion of China. So I'm going to look at the two measures of what I call you know, su support to insiders. So, policies uh, or phenomena that uh, uh, are correlated to, uh, uh, you know, to having a, a particular advantage for, for some actors. The first is barriers to entry, which is exactly the one we looked at in 2006. Now there, there, are, there are better data, so we, we can use, uh, uh, we can rely on, on more data available from the, from the World Bank, and we can also take them until 2014, because it's always uh, healthy to see that one's theory uh, continue to, to work. Uh, the other is a measure of corruption. So <laughs> corruption often means a particular way of solving some agency problem that has, the, you know, by, by its own nature, tends to create position of advantage and not equal conditions. So you know, wh when you speak to people in China, the first thing they tell you, well, in China, being connected is important. Why? Well, it's related to the fact that, that corruption is a very important uh, factor of uh, life and business uh, in China. So, uh, 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 and, and I'm also going to look at another measure, which is a proxy for the innovativeness of the economy, uh, R&D as percentage of GDP. I'm going to use a measure of the World Bank. I will show you some, num some uh, uh, graph based on uh, non-OECD countries, but actually the results hold true also if you include OECD countries. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, three set of pictures. These are international data, so we are not yet in China. Uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, measures of barriers as uh, proxied by uh, the, the number of procedures needed to start uh, a new business. Uh, there are other measures, the result would be uh, pretty similar. And I'm categorizing countries in uh, high versus low barriers by taking the average, unfortunately the, the, time, the time series I mentioned is still very limited, so one cannot do much on that in terms of the, of the barriers. So here I'm looking at the average uh, barriers uh, to entry and I'm, I'm distinguishing between uh, uh, higher and lower than the median. Uh, so on the, on the, top, uh, the top graph you see um, uh, th these are just uh, pooled regressions. Don't pay attention to the level because there, is, there are normalizations involved. Pay attention to the slope. So the slope there shows that countries with uh, high barriers, when you pull uh, a five years average observation on the growth rate, uh, so here it's a pool cross section and time series. Well, there is a, a, a negatively sloped uh, relationship between uh, uh, growth rate and uh, uh, GDP per worker relative to the US. And the interesting thing is that the slope is uh, in absolute value higher than on the, on the right hand side for low barriers country. Now, perhaps more interesting, they, the same is true when you, do, when you run within regression. So when you control for fixed effect, well, it looks as if uh, countries with high barriers uh, tends to be uh, significantly more prone to a decline of the growth rate as they approach the frontier relative to countries with low barriers. 
The same picture is true when I look at corruption. So uh, actually here I can tell you the average, the, the average effect of barrier indeed de depends on, on the distance of the frontier. Corruption in general tends to be bad because it's also a mixture of uh, uh, you know, some agency problem and some other rent extraction phenomena. But, uh, but when you look at uh, the slope, uh, it's much more harmful for an economy to, to be in a high corruption regime when this economy comes close to the technology frontier than when the, that economy is far from it. Uh, for R&D, uh, as uh, again in, in, in line with our way of thinking, it's uh, the countries that uh, put less investment on R&D. Actually, here I was a bit surprised because I thought uh, there is little signal in the data from non-OECD countries that don't invest much in R&D. Well, again, the, the, the results are quite uh, uh, stable and, and robust. Uh, we have run regressions uh, in a more formal way than the graph that uh, I have shown you. Let me just uh, take you uh, through one of them, the case of corruption. Uh, so uh, you can control for education, uh, fix effect. Uh, you can also try to instrument uh, using dynamic panel techniques. The results are very robust. And in panel B, you see a specification that instead of uh, uh, classifying countries at high and low barriers, actually it's a continuous measure. So it's an interaction specification, and the theory predicts that the interaction between proximity and the measure of corruption, the way it is defined, should be negative. Uh, it is negative, and in most cases, not all, uh, highly significant. Okay, so having given you this picture, let me move, uh, let me move to China. So uh, the first part of the talk, which is uh, the one that relies on uh, uh, you know, papers that have been finished and published, uh, not all uh, uh, involving me, but uh, uh, I will have something more stable to say. On uh, the transition to innovation at growth, I will present some work in progress. So this is uh, actually when did the investment-led growth uh, uh, start in China? My prior was, well, uh, we, there is nothing useful if we look at uh, uh, the time before the, 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 the reform under Deng Xiaoping, uh, because uh, before the economic uh, performance was disastrous. Actually, uh, it was not a great economic performance. I'm not trying to say that uh, the institutions of the Cultural Revolution were conducive to, uh, to good outcomes. But uh, uh, it's interesting that a, a, rec a recent study that have tried to go very deep into the data construction, uh, the relevant uh, prices, et cetera, uh, by Chermukin, Guryov, Golosov, and Sivinsky, uh, argues that uh, uh, you know, when you estimate the growth rate under Mao, it was not uh, uh, at all a, a picture of a static economy. It was certainly an economy that was growing less fast than uh, uh, the economies after the economic reforms, but still there was a lot of capital accumulation. There was also some, some TFP growth. It was started from a very low, low level. The population growth was very high, especially after the Great Leap Forward. So in the end, the, the, if you measure GDP per capita growth, it was not very high, but still there was, uh, there was uh, some uh, uh, economic growth. After the reform, we have observed a significant acceleration in TFP growth, a faster reduction of the intersectoral wedges. That means that the distortion in the economy that were uh, rampant during uh, Mao uh, China, they became uh, smaller and smaller over time, although they are still large today. What explains the change? Well, I wish I could give you just uh, one explanation convincing you that that's all. I think that uh, uh, the literature uh, has looked at many factors, uh, and I think that uh, you know, all of them uh, play an important role. So let me list them, and here is one of the cases where really my, my, my uh, uh, choice of articles is very selective, and uh, uh, please do not, uh, uh, you know, don't, do not think that I'm trying to be exhaustive or saying these are the only important contribution. Uh, agricultural reforms uh, uh, in the early 1980s were certainly very, very important. So they were certainly uh, the trigger, uh, one of the trigger of the process of change. Uh, a couple of recent papers, one by uh, 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 Aguillon and uh, co-authors, uh, and one that I will uh, give you more highlight about uh, uh, involving me, uh, uh, provide some quantitative uh, uh, evaluation of this, the effect of this industrial policy. Reallocation, as I was saying, was uh, uh, very important. Uh, uh, you know, Shane Klino has an influential paper in QJ 2009. Uh, Brandon Shu has a series of uh, uh, paper and some of my work with uh, uh, Song and Stories Latin that I will uh, review. There was an improvement in the governance and the performance of uh, 
uh, state-owned enterprises uh, uh, once uh, they were forced to compete with uh, uh, private enter enterprises. The technology transfer, uh, um, uh, uh, and, you know, this, there is a recent paper by Holmes, McGratton, and Prescott, for instance, that uh, analyzed the importance of this mechanism. Um, another, like more political economic factor, is the change of values and career incentive uh, within the Chinese Communist Party that uh, changes from uh, pure reward uh, to loyalty uh, to reward of uh, uh, economic performance, also with important distortions like, uh, uh, you know, that could have been some effect on the environmental disasters. There is a nice paper published in the Journal of European Economic Association by Kudamatsu G and same. Uh, local state capacity and selective support to firms. I will come to that. Okay, so let me say something about uh, the uh, 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 industrial policy. So, special economic zones uh, are a very important uh, component of the industrial policy of China, and I would argue that, uh, uh, you know, although there, were, there was certainly an important, uh, there, there were a, a, a variety of elements associated with them, the one that was especially important was the promotion of investment in selected areas, and the promotion of technology transfer by attracting foreign direct uh, uh, investment. So it was a place-based policy, uh, and place-based policy in the literature are not always that popular. Uh, many of the empirical studies find that uh, they, they rather shift resources around creating distortion rather than being especially useful. Well, in our study, we find that uh, these policies were actually important for the uh, development uh, uh, of China. So let me give you, uh, uh, you know, a quick uh, slideshow of uh, how they were introduced. In the 1980, there were four special economic zones. In 1988, uh, uh, there was expansion uh, almost uh, so, no, entirely on the, on the coastal areas. And then as of 1992, we have the expansion of the special economic zones inside the country. And this actually has continued. And uh, there are different types of special economic zones. Um, I won't have the, the time to, 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 to go into the details. So here the goals were increasing investment, exploiting agglomeration externality, favor technology transfer, and also experimenting with capitalistic uh, institution. And we, we try to understand how important uh, uh, these uh, uh, special economic zones uh, have been uh, in promoting development uh, with you know, a kind of alternative hypothesis being that they just uh, moved around resources. So they just uh, favored uh, uh, location A over location B, but you know, that uh, uh, there was a, perhaps a differential effect, but not, uh, not a net effect. Well, uh, we exploit the fact that uh, the establishment of the special economic zone was staggered over the years, as I've shown you before, uh, and you know, so there is variation both across localities and over time, and we exploit a difference in different strategies similar to the paper um, uh, with uh, uh, Philippa Guillon, uh, Robin Burgess, and Steve Redding uh, uh, that uh, we use to analyze the effect uh, of uh, 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 policy uh, of industrial policy in India. Now, something important that we check uh, here is just since the difference in difference does uh, identify differential effects, we would like also to see what type of spillovers these zones have created. So we have a simple model that tries to look at uh, the effect of the special economic zones uh, as a function of the distance from where the special economic zone is located. And what we find uh, are uh, effects, uh, relatively large and in any case statistically significant, that are positive. So being close to special economic zones uh, was uh, beneficial. So uh, uh, this suggests that uh, this was not uh, simply a reshuffling of resources, but it, there was uh, a positive uh, net effect. Uh, and we find that special economic zones were associated with a 20% increase in GDP and GDP per capita, positive effect on investment, human capital, and total factor productivity. Uh, and uh, you see in the graph uh, what, what type of effect, uh, uh, the type of effect we, uh, we estimate. So in conclusion, we, 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 we find that this industrial policy appeared to have uh, uh, been successful, although, you know, this, uh, this conclusion is uh, uh, still subject to further validation, uh, given that, in any case, we exploit some differential effect. Now, another very important uh, source of uh, growth in this uh, investment-led uh, stage is real, has been reallocation. So a large share of the post-reform Chinese economic growth is explained by reallocation, part of it 
be it uh, industrialization and urbanization that was uh, uh, very important uh, after the start of economic reform, part of it be within the manufacturing sector. And here, uh, the process of privatization in China was very important in the, in the 1990s. So until the 1990s, actually until the second half of the 1990s, there were essentially no private enterprise owned by Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, initially, uh, foreign entrepreneurs uh, were uh, allowed and invited actually to invest in China. Uh, then progressively, the tolerance uh, towards uh, uh, investment uh, done by domestic entrepreneurs uh, increased. And eventually, in 1997, with uh, uh, the 15th Congress of the Communist Party of China, the slogan, grasp the large firm, uh, let go of the small one, meant the economy, it's no longer an economy for state-owned enterprises only. State-owned enterprises have to compete with each other at market terms, often distorted market terms, and with private uh, enterprises. Those that do not survive uh, are going to be shut down or privatized. It was, like, it was a big earthquake because everything in the life of people depended before on state-owned enterprises, the pension, the housing, and so a lot of institutions had to be adjusted uh, at that point. Now, from the point of view of economic growth, just this uh, transition, so the fact that uh, many more productive uh, uh, private firms came into existence and that uh, state-owned enterprises were either forced to become more productive or uh, uh, forced to shut down, well, that created a lot of growth. According to our estimates, uh, I mean, in the, in, the, in the period where this was more intense, uh, it could account between 50 and 70 percent of the growth of the manufacturing sector, which is very important in China. Now, if you look at the data, this is from uh, uh, the National Business Service, so this is uh, uh, the universe of uh, Chinese firm, and on, it's an av the average uh, uh, of the profitability and, and any me measure of rate of return to capital in private enterprises, here the red line, uh, DPE stands for the domest domestic private enterprises, is higher than that of the state-owned enterprises in blue. And there is a very strong uh, and fast transition that from 1998 uh, uh, till 2008, uh, turns the employment share of the, the domestic private enterprise in manufacturing from 5% to 60%. Again, this number is, should be subject to further scrutiny because it very much depends on what one means by private firms. In many cases, these are firms that uh, have some joint ownership, and here the classification is according to the majority of the ownership. But, but uh, the, the shape of this is, uh, is very important. Is, is, is very prominent. So uh, in our uh, uh, study, Growing Like China, in 2011, we argue that the growth uh, of uh, these private enterprises that was the m most important source uh, of reallocation and economic growth. It was uh, also uh, significantly constrained by the uh, limited access to credit market that forces this, this firm to be essentially largely uh, uh, self-financed. And so with this theory in which we have uh, growth driven uh, uh, mostly by transition, uh, we can match quantitatively a, a set uh, of, uh, of facts. I would say the most important I want to highlight, because it has been uh, prominent also in the, in the debate, is the fact that uh, the, the labor share in uh, China has been falling during uh, a period until, certainly until 2008. And the, the theory provides an explanation for this. Uh, it's, a, it's an explanation that says that well, low wage growth during the transition is, what is explained by the fact that wages are set in the low productivity sector, so private capital accumulates, uh, but entrepreneurs face along the transition an infinitely elastic uh, supply of labor. So it, it is as if this large reserve of workers working in low productivity state-owned enterprises uh, uh, were a, a labor force reserve, similar to the uh, mechanism in the model of uh, Arthur Lewis uh, or more, more recently, uh, Jaume Ventura. And, and this transition is also consistent with the observation that there were uh, non-decreasing returns to investment, fast out of growth, and we also explain uh, the emergence of a foreign uh, imbalance, of which I will not uh, talk about. Now, the, uh, if privatization was very important, another part of the uh, you know, overall explanation of this uh, great success is, uh, or, or is at least potentially related 
to the improving performance of the surviving state-owned enterprises. So this is taken by a paper by Shang Tai Shek and Michael Song. Uh, what they document in this uh, Brookings Papers uh, 2006 paper is that uh, during this period of uh, transition that I documented, so until 2007, the, um, uh, the total factor productivity growth was actually higher in state-owned enterprises than in uh, private enterprises. The level of productivity was lower in the beginning and remains lower at the end. But uh, because of the selection process that uh, forces for, uh, unproductive firms to exit or to privatize, the gap was actually reduced in a period in which there was everywhere very high to, uh, total factor productivity growth. So the, uh, this is a graph that I invite you to stare because I'm going to show you a few more later, uh, uh, later on. So uh, it's, it's, it should be read in the following way. There is a firms are broken down by their TFP percentile. So on, on the left, close to zero, you have very unproductive firm, and uh, 100 is the most productive firm that, uh, that, that you have. So firms are classified by percentile, and then there is a compa the, the, the interesting thing here is the comparison in this particular graph, the comparison between the to total factor of productivity in private and in state-owned enterprises. One means the same. You see, all, 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 the entire graph is smaller than one because the total factor of productivity of sta state-owned enterprises is lower. Uh, but if you compare 1998, the blue line, with 2007, the, re the red line, you see that there is a significant relative improvement uh, in the performance. Now, uh, a bit as a matter, uh, as a kind of side remark, but uh, it's perhaps one of the most important findings of this paper, uh, it turns out that the improvement uh, inside this uh, uh, less efficient sector was not uh, particularly important for average growth. Why? Well, because uh, 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 although the productivity of state-owned enterprise increased over time, the relative productivity remained lower than the private enterprises, and these enterprises attracted more resources than they would have done if they hadn't uh, uh, improved their own performance. So in the end, the, the, uh, mis the increased misallocation between state-owned enterprises and private enterprises uh, offset, and in some experiment even more than offset, the positive effect of uh, uh, increasing productivity in state-owned enterprises. Now, so to some extent, the conclusion of this is that privatization and the private sector was the main uh, uh, source of success uh, of uh, Chinese economic growth in this stage. But uh, here I want to uh, go back uh, to, the, to the initial discussion and emphasize the particular nature of this process that uh, doesn't have always uh, a rosy and virtuous picture or, or depiction of uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurial sector. Uh, there is a very interesting paper by, by uh, Xian Song in 2015, uh, and uh, I admit I mutuated my title, Chronic Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics, from their old title, for some reason, was changed in the more uh, uh, neutral, the Institutional Foundation of, Economic, of China's Growth, but I think the first title uh, is more informative. Uh, what they, what they uh, show is that actually the barrier to entry in China are the formal barriers to entry are very high. In fact, if you calculate, uh, if you look at the World Bank indicator, it takes at least uh, 272 days to start a new business. And in this ranking, China is comparable uh, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is you know, a failed state where we tend to think uh, 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 things don't, uh, don't, uh, don't work uh, well. China is a middle-income country instead. So China, in terms of formal institution, tend to score always uh, very low. But well, there was something very important happens in China during this period, and it was a process of uh, decentralization accompanied by a very strong uh, local state capacity, which uh, was very important for uh, lo in enabling local government uh, to overcome the formal barriers. Essentially, uh, there was a market out there for monopoly rents, uh, the local uh, organization and the local government uh, could uh, uh, round about uh, this uh, bad formal institution by allowing not all, any firm, by particular firm which we, we, with which uh, they strike agreement, uh, to give them a monopoly power over the local market. So in this sense, uh, I think this is a very, uh, a very good uh, example of uh, 
uh, the type of institution that uh, select uh, some particular subject, uh, some, some particular economic actors, some firms, and give them the opportunity to make large profit and large uh, uh, investment. Now, of course, this, uh, uh, this, was, uh, this is consistent with uh, uh, a high uh, tolerance for corruption, and it is the model of growth uh, that has dominated at least uh, before the uh, uh, new recent campaign of uh, Xi Jinping. So the, the interesting aspect is that although this uh, is a, a bit, bit like the opposite of level playing field competition within local areas, in China there are many cities and also many party organizations. And so the competition between these uh, uh, different uh, uh, cities and different organizations uh, has remained alive and in some way has played a role of partial substitutes of uh, the market competition. Well, here's a picture that I think summarizes well. Uh, it's from their paper, so, uh, uh, but it summarizes well <laughs> the, 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 the state of affairs. You go to any city, all taxes are identical, but you go to another city, it's a different type of taxes. So uh, that's, uh, that's a type of uh, you know, investment-led uh, growth uh, or crony capitalism with uh, Chinese characteristics. Interesting, uh, private entrepreneurs uh, uh, appear to be grateful because, you know, in this uh, system in which uh, incumbents are strongly protected and also uh, in, a, in a situation in which wage growth is compressed, uh, partly by institutional reason and also part by policy, um, there was, uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, are a very, very successful categories. So one might expect that uh, as the economy gets privatized, uh, firm owners would uh, become a threat to the political uh, system of the monopoly uh, of power of a single party. Uh, not necessarily so. There is a study by uh, Ikai Wang uh, who reports uh, 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 service uh, over uh, um, the attitudes of different social groups on uh, 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 towards democracy, well, uh, if you look at entrepreneurs, they are the least positive about, about democracy relative to other social groups. You might expect that, uh, you know, communist ideology, if anything, uh, appeals uh, to uh, regular workers, it appeals uh, 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 in this form to entrepreneurs. In fact, it's more, it's more telling whether one is an entrepreneur uh, than if one is a member of the Communist Party of China. So being a Communist Party of China makes uh, the respondent uh, uh, less positive towards democracy, but being an entrepreneur has a stronger effect uh, than that. So the question is how far can this system go? Well, it has certainly been successful in stimulating investments. Uh, it has created a lot of uh, connection, but uh, it's not good at, 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 at uh, uh, creating you know, churning and uh, innovation at the decentralized level. Now, since 2012, the uh, corruption campaign inaugurated by Xi Jinping uh, means also a threat to its uh, viability and the way it has gone uh, uh, for, uh, for a decade uh, or so. Uh, and the, the authors of this paper raised the question, well, is this leading to a different type of uh, growth? Well, that requires additional reform or another possibility is may choke off growth altogether. Now, uh, the last uh, uh, bit uh, of uh, investment-led uh, growth that I want to mention is uh, the Chinese uh, uh, economic uh, stimulus uh, package. Uh, so, as I mentioned, you know, if you also remember my pictures, uh, my picture before, around 2008, there is uh, overall an, the end of this uh, magic process of reallocation that produced so high growth, and uh, at the same time, uh, the world enter. Uh, the, the Great Recession, and uh, uh, China initially appears to be uh, affected by the, the fall in the international demand, and so there are also signs uh, of slowdown. Uh, the Chinese uh, State Council uh, uh, decides to intervene with a very powerful plan that injects uh, something like 600 billion US dollars, that if you, if you make uh, the comparison is, is a larger uh, intervention than, than uh, the uh, um, stimulus package in, in, in the US, uh, mostly focus on infrastructure. So public infrastructure, in fact, uh, attracts uh, the lion's share of this uh, uh, investment, 38% uh, of the total. And this is accompanied by a policy where the People Bank of China prompts a significant ease of private credit. 
So there is a, a series of uh, uh, change, political changes. Part of it is uh, direct investment uh, uh, by uh, the central and by the local government, and also relaxation of the uh, uh, um, control and the regulation uh, over uh, uh, investment. So this was a plan that was largely welcomed by the World Bank and also had important uh, positive effects. So in the short run, China escaped the great, the great Recession, essentially. If you look at the average growth rate of China 2008-11, this is about 9.5%. There was a redu reduction in trade surplus, an acceleration of wage growth, and also significant improvement in infrastructure. There was also an important credit boom. If you look at the aggregate finance into the real economy, between 2008 and 2009, it went up uh, by a factor of two in level. So, Relative to what we have argued in our pre previous work, this might be actually good news because you know we have argued that uh, uh, we are uh, China suffered from uh, uh, a strict regime of financial repression, so the, the easier availability of uh, external financing uh, could potentially uh, favor uh, small and medium enterprises and also more competition. Well, it turns out. Uh, a number of studies point at the fact that this is not what happened. In fact, this easy credit uh, uh, only in a limited part, in a very limited part, went to finance uh, small and medium private enterprises. It was rather channeled to local government, construction, mining sector, and there was a boom of pet projects from local government. So uh, this implies that uh, uh, actually there was uh, 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 you know, an, an additional spur uh, using, again, my lang language of uh, investment-led growth. Uh, this is, uh, for instance, what is argued by, uh, by uh, Liu and Yao in, uh, in, a recent, in a recent paper, where, where they, they argue that uh, investment rate uh, uh, has uh, also had effect uh, on wages and, and on the incentive for people to accumulate uh, human capital. So <clears throat> this is uh, you know, my picture of uh, the past of, of uh, China. I want to spend my uh, last uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, in talking about uh, some uh, more recent uh, research where we are trying to uh, get to uh, a question that it's uh, not, uh, not uh, very easy uh, to answer, but uh, we are trying to make our best, uh, best attempt. So <clears throat> the question is, uh, is, China grow is Chinese growth turning more innovation-led? Well, the, the, the natural candidate to look at is uh, investment in innovative activities. I would say two indicators are those we normally use as economists uh, for looking at uh, innovative investment. One is R&D expenditure in the, in the research and development. One is uh, patents. There has been a boom of both. I will focus on research and development expenditure, although we plan later to match these two patent data, because studies so far on patents have overall found very mixed results about, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a sense in which uh, the boom of patents uh, uh, appears to be very much related to uh, incentive uh, uh, created by, by regulations. And uh, it has been very difficult to find uh, robust uh, correlations with uh, productivity growth. I will show you that with R&D, uh, and I will go to the firm level analysis, this is instead, instead the case. So let me start from the macro picture. Uh, emerging uh, economies typically invest uh, a much uh, smaller share of their GDP in uh, R&D. In fact, uh, uh, you know, most of them are below 1% or around 1%. And if you go back to China in, uh, uh, in the 1990s, that's, that was the case. So it was, China was a typical uh, emerging economy. Now, if you, if you move uh, from uh, uh, 1999 and onwards, uh, the aggregate expenditure in R&D has gone up big time. And today it accounts uh, for 2.1% of the GDP, which is higher, slightly higher than the average for the European uh, uh, Union. But considering that China is a middle income economy, is a, is a, is a, is a major outlier somehow. Uh, in fact, uh, China spends uh, a larger share of uh, uh, R&D, uh, of, of its GDP in R&D than uh, do United Kingdom and Italy, for instance, although still less than United States, uh, Switzerland, or Germany. Now, of course, this is an input, not an output. So 
the quest, natural question is, well, it could be that uh, this is just uh, the result uh, of some uh, uh, political or policy intervention. Uh, uh, you know, if you read the acts uh, of the uh, uh, five year, for the last five-year plans, or also the earlier one, uh, there is a strong emphasis, actually, of the authority in promoting uh, innovation and innovation-led uh, growth. But that could result, uh, you know, in state-owned enterprises uh, uh, classifying as R&D uh, some expenditure that they would have done it anyway, or worse, uh, doing some uh, non-productive uh, R&D. So the, the question we are trying to get to is uh, uh, which firms do R&D? Uh, what is an efficient allocation of the R&D expenditure, and is China uh, really investing productively this uh, growing share of uh, its uh, total investment? Uh, so let me go uh, for a moment uh, to uh, a general theoretical framework, because uh, I think we, know we, we don't have uh, that many uh, uh, guide, uh, you know, guide, that, that much guidance uh, to uh, give the answer to this question. So, which firms should do uh, R&D and which firms should not do it? Uh, there are models, uh, 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 but uh, mm, uh, let me let me mention uh, uh, a paper that I, uh, uh, Michael Koenig, Jan Lawrence, and I recently published on theoretical economics. Uh, this is uh, a model of uh, endogenous growth with endogenous firm dynamics, where the uh, productivity growth, uh, uh, the entire growth distribution uh, uh, moves over time. Uh, firms uh, have the option to improve, upgrade their productivity, either by uh, doing uh, an act of innovation, so searching for a better technology that in the data we map to R&D expenditure, or by imitating the technology uh, used by other firms. In this case, uh, we, we model it as a matching process where firms that are, are uh, if they decide not to do R&D but to, to imitate, they are randomly matched uh, with uh, a number of firms and they can pick the firm that has the highest uh, productivity with, with possibly some additional friction. So uh, from the theory point of view, in this paper we show that productivity distribution converges to what we call a traveling wave so it's a distribution that has two Pareto tails uh, and that we show that uh, matches uh, some of the empirical evidence for uh, industrialized countries. Now, the aspect that uh, we take to the data for China is the following. Um, in a world without friction, they, uh, it would be efficient and optimal that uh, you know, firms above a certain productivity threshold do the innovation and firms below the productivity threshold do the imitation. Of course, you know, this could be at the industry level, you know, some level of disaggregation, but you know, if a firm is very unproductive to begin with, it has a lot of opportunities to imitate, otherwise it should uh, do the innovation. And that's what they do in the, in the simplest version of the model. Now, you can introduce into that model, as uh, for instance in, in the fashion of uh, uh, Shane Klino's uh, uh, recent uh, series of paper, some wedges, some type of distortion in the, in the allocation of resources. This could be uh, wedges on uh, hiring labor, could be wedges on, uh, in the capital market, so firms may have a high, some firms may have a higher opportunity cost, uh, a higher cost of accessing financing than others, or uh, specific wedges, uh, wedges that are specific to innovation, innovation, innovation capacity. So if you, once you introduce these wedges and uh, you know, somehow scramble the, the efficient uh, distribution, well, you still retain a correlation between uh, the proximity of the frontier and uh, doing uh, innovation versus imitation, but that uh, uh, correlation becomes lower and lower, and the bigger is the size of these wedges, the more important, uh, so the, the lower becomes this correlation. So with this in mind, we're going to look at the data for, for China, and we are also going to compare them with the data for Taiwan, an economy that we know has succeeded. Okay, so uh, let me start with a, a theoretical prediction that I, I've just uh, laid out. So an efficient allocation of R&D uh, in our theory requires that high TFP uh, firms invest uh, in R&D, uh, as, and, and that low TFP firms don't invest in R&D. And then it also predicts that certain wedges that we can measure in the data uh, cause misallocation. I should say that uh, this is based on joint work with uh, Michael Koenig, Michael Song, and Chattel Storis Latin. Uh, and um, I will also see how this, the picture changes over time 
um, and I will show you some, some results. So this is, I'm not going to uh, show you, uh, you know, what in the end we want to do, which is to estimate a structure, structurally this. I'm going to show you some regression. So I'm not going to show it because I wouldn't have the time and also because we haven't done it yet. So um, the first regression I want to uh, emphasize is, uh, uh, so I'm going to show you a series of regression that look at the extensive margin of uh, uh, growth of uh, uh, R&D investment, sorry. So uh, we have done this for extensive or intensive. Extensive margin meaning, mean, meaning doing versus not doing R&D. Very few firms in all countries uh, spend on R&D. So one could look at uh, you know, the, the, the correlations between characteristics of firms and uh, doing uh, versus not doing R&D. Or you could look within the population of firms that do R&D, which one do more and how it correlates with TFP. What I'm going to show you now is the extensive margin, but the intensive margin is pretty similar. So first of all, uh, and all the regression I'm going to show you, control for industry dummy at the three-digit level, and uh, we could, uh, and the results are similar with the four-digit uh, uh, industries. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that uh, in the universe, this is data is based on the universe of uh, uh, Chinese firms, and we have R&D in 2001 and in 2007. Well, there is a, a high and significant uh, uh, correlation between doing R&D and the total factor productivity as we uh, estimate. So in column one is uh, uh, without controlling for other wedges. In column two is after controlling for investment and labor wedges. In column three is also controlling for firm fixed effect. So we are essentially looking at firm that switch into or out to R&D uh, in the two periods that uh, we are considering. Uh, and so, you know, the, the coefficient is significantly different in column two and column three. This is not surprising because a lot of the variation comes uh, from, uh, uh, you know, cross, uh, uh, you know, is, is a cross firm rather than within. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, you know, it could be a signal that a lot of this uh, is driven by uh, heterogeneity. But uh, there is no pretense here of identification. I, I'm just interpreting this as correlation. So in China, firms with high total factor productivity are more likely to do R&D. Uh, firms with uh, high measured wedges that we can retrieve from the data, labor wedges and investment wedges, are less likely to do R&D. If we look at ownership, actually there is uh, uh, significant, actually, these effects, uh, I won't have time to get into the details, but are also sizable quantitatively. Uh, so these uh, uh, state-owned enterprises actually do more R&D than uh, uh, private enterprises. So there is evidence that some of the allocation is driven by ownership. This could be a sign of uh, uh, misallocation. The second question is whether the R&D allocation improves or worsens over time. So we can look at whether this uh, correlation increases or, in, or decreases over time. Well, this picture already, sh already gives you the, the answer. We have also done it in a regression fashion. So in 2001, although firms that do R&D are on average, uh, have on average a higher total factor productivity, the difference is not very large. Whereas in 2007, this difference becomes, uh, becomes larger. And if you do it uh, uh, by regression, you, you find you have the same finding. Uh, it's also interesting to look uh, at switchers. So we have firms in 2001 and 2007, and if you look at the firms that uh, were not doing R&D in 2001, and they do firms in 2007, uh, what is their distribution over uh, total factor productivity? Well, this is given by the red line, and the red line shows particularly look at the, at the left and at the left and graph, which is based on uh, total factor productivity in 2001, which has uh, less. Uh, dramatic endogeneity problem. Well, it's uh, uh, clear that the, there is a positively sloped relationship. It looks as if the firm that starts doing R&D between 2001 and 2007 are mostly firms with, uh, higher, with high productivity. We can also look at the firms that stop doing R&D. This is the blue line. Then we find no correlation. Well, again, R&D is an input. Do we have is there evidence that uh, uh, R&D at the firm level predicts uh, higher productivity growth? Uh, well, the answer is yes. Uh, both in 2001 uh, and in 2007, uh, 
productivity, future productivity growth is predicted by, on average, by uh, uh, doing R&D, and also on the intensive margin, firms that do more R&D uh, have a higher productivity growth. It's especially interesting, the second of these two pictures, because you see that when you look at the, uh, so the first correspond to the 2001, predicting the growth 2001, 2007. The second is 2007, predicting growth 2007, 2012. And you see that uh, uh, so the red lines are the, the red uh, the red picture is firms that do R&D and the, and the red curve the blue curve is firms that do not do R&D. So uh, uh, in uh, in 2001 uh, the entire distribution is shifted on on the right. It means that uh, uh, future growth is higher for firms that do R&D. Uh, in 2007, on average, this is still the case, but more so for firms that have a higher productivity. So. Firms with high TFP appear to, uh, appear to be, again, in a, in a correlation sense at this point, as the firms that actually uh, benefit most uh, from R&D, and there is a positive uh, average effect uh, of doing R&D. So R&D is a predictor of, uh, of growth. All of this is good, but uh, somehow qualitative. What is the benchmark? Well, we went to Taiwan, and we got the data from the universe of Taiwanese firm, and we drew some comparison. And the comparison uh, gives the following uh, verdict. Well, uh, everything, all the correlations have the sign that uh, our theory predicts from, from China. Remember, no correlation in, at, with the lens of our model would, would be a sign of misallocation of R&D. Well, Taiwan has a much steeper correlation than China. So in this graph, again, firms are, uh, like, like I told before, firms are, are plotted by percentiles of TFP. So on 100 are the most productive firm, on zero the least productive firm. We do the same for the Taiwanese firms. And you see that the, the, the curve is much steeper for the Taiwanese firm than for the Chinese firm. So there is much more sorting uh, in line with uh, the prediction of our model in Taiwan. And one interpretation that you can give, and the structural model would, uh, would actually calls for that, is that there is more misallocation of R&D in China in 2001, 2007, uh, then in Taiwan, 1998, uh, 1993. Why do we go to 1988, 1993? Well, because we think it's uh, more useful to compare China to what uh, Taiwan was uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we cannot go further back for, for, data, uh, for data constraints when Taiwan was, uh, uh, you know, was already rich than China today, but uh, somehow more comparable. But uh, we are collecting more data to do this uh, uh, in a more systematic way. Um, it is also the case that the relationship between uh, R&D and future total factor productivity growth is much stronger in Taiwan than uh, in China when you compare the two periods. So, and particularly so for firms that are very productive. You see that we have put it in the same scale here. So before it looked like there was a difference. Now in China, there is hardly any difference. Well, it's because of the uh, scale in which we are representing. We want to represent it in the same scale as China and Taiwan. And you see that in Taiwan, the effect, uh, the correlation is, is, is much higher and more so for firms uh, in the, in the uh, high uh, TFP uh, percentile. Remember that here we are controlling for, so it's, it, it, of course, you know, at any level of aggregation, there is some, some composition effect that one may worry. But here we are controlling for uh, uh, f uh, firm uh, fixed effect uh, at the, at the four-digit level. So it's, it's very, it's very fine, finely grid. Uh, OK, so since my time is running short, uh, this, is just a, this is just a regression representation of what I've shown you. In both China and uh, Taiwan, uh, you know, uh, doing R&D predicts future growth, and <coughs> uh, but more so in Taiwan than in China. And also, the, uh, this is stronger and stronger uh, for high TFP growth than for low TFP growth. So, in summary, what we see is that actually this boom of expenditure in R&D is associated with something that looks like a better allocation of R&D, but in terms of level and in terms of you know, comparative development relative to the benchmark of Taiwan, this is uh, uh, still uh, uh, suggests uh, much more of the misallocation uh, and also the fact that state-owned enterprises do much more R&D than private enterprises uh, and that uh, uh, you know, there are these uh, large effect of the wedges and we know the wedges are more important, especially in the capital market for, uh, for uh, 
um, private enterprises suggests that there is still a, a, a big amount of misallocation. Uh, so my time is coming to an end. I would have liked also to say something about uh, uh, the increase in uh, human capital, but I will uh, uh, actually skip this and uh, uh, instead uh, come to a conclusion. Um, so I want to, to take stock of these uh, you know, uh, highlights I gave you and uh, also from my uh, general view about the growth process uh, in China. First of all, you know, there is a lot of discussion within outside China about uh, whether the growth miracle is going to continue. I think that any reasonable forecast must uh, be that uh, uh, the growth is set to slow down. So we will observe, we will not observe China growing at 10% over the, the next uh, uh, 20 years. So it's partly physiological, it's partly neoclassical convergence. However, uh, there are uh, signs uh, that suggest that uh, the slowdown may actually be much, may be more pronounced than with what we see in current days, largely because uh, a lot of uh, what sustained this growth rate around six to seven percent appears to be a somewhat desperate attempt to keep the figures good. Uh, I think that uh, to uh, avoid a more severe slowdown, China still needs more uh, emphasis on financial liberalization and financial development, uh, better institution for investor protection, like independent judicial system, which is, of course, uh, one of the areas where uh, there is uh, a, a more tension with uh, the nature of the political system of China, uh, more level playing field competition, less formal barrier. There is some evidence in the microdata that uh, uh, China is actually making a transition towards a more innovation-driven uh, model. Uh, there is also, but this is still very preliminary, a sense in which uh, uh, this is subject to important uh, uh, misallocation problem. Um, from the policy point of view, uh, I believe that uh, uh, imposing or self-imposing very demanding uh, short-term growth objective is likely to call for bigger troubles in future. So uh, I'm not uh, uh, claiming uh, any, any uh, you know, particular influence on the Chinese leadership, but uh, if I were to give a suggestion, I would say do the structural reform, don't worry uh, about having, you know, three or four percent uh, growth rate uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, couple of years. I don't have the impression that this is a line the current leadership uh, uh, is taking. There is a big question that I have not touched upon, uh, not because uh, uh, I think it's unimportant, I think it's probably more important than anything I've said, but uh, uh, you know, is uh, uh, the nature itself of the uh, institution in China consistent with this transition in innovation-led growth? I think there, is, there are big question mark, and in you know, in some in some way, uh, creating equal condition and competition in all the experience that we have had so far uh, has uh, gone together with uh, open uh, political institution, uh, and this is of course uh, a critical area where uh, we don't see uh, at the moment much change in China. Thank you.